Hello, and welcome to Exploring Global Problems, a podcast where we talk to academics from Swansea University whose groundbreaking research is tackling global challenges from health innovation to sustainable futures and the environment, from digital technologies to clean energy. My name is Sam Blaxland, and today I'm joined by Paul Dyson, Professor of Medicine at Swansea University. His research explores bacteria and the role it plays in our health and well-being. He also focuses on how these bacteria can be enhanced for medical and agricultural uses. Professor Paul Dyson, welcome to Exploring Global Problems. Good to see you. Thank you very much. Can you, just to start us off, give us an overview of what your research is about and the challenges that you face in doing it? For several years, my focus of, on, of, of my research was actually on soil bacteria that produce antibiotics. Um, and as you know, we have a global crisis in terms of antibiotic resistance in, in uh, pathogenic bacteria. So there's always a need to try and discover new antibiotics which can be used in medicine. So we are continuing that. Um, but about 10 years ago, one of my colleagues who's an entomologist, her name's Miranda, she came to me. Um, she'd just come back from working in the lab of uh, Jules Hoffman, who won a Nobel Prize for understanding insect immunity. And so she'd been working in his lab, working on mosquitoes, which are disease vectors. And, and she'd been trying to use a technique which is called RNA interference in these mosquitoes. She knew about my background as a microbiologist, so she came to me with, uh, and we sat down and we discussed the possibility of actually using bacteria that live inside an insect to deliver the RNA interference. Instead of having to inject them, the bacteria that normally live inside the insect will be producing the molecules which cause the RNA interference. And um, well, this has changed my sort of research pathway, if you like, and what have we, what I've been focusing on for the last 10 years. So, I mean, uh, what I'd like to do is talk about both what we're doing with the insects, but then also, uh, and maybe we want to start with this, is, is what we're doing also in terms of cancer, as a cancer therapy. I would like to talk about all of that, and we will start with the cancer. Just before we do, um, I read something about, um, and maybe this does come into the, the cancer element of it, about your work with symbiotic bacteria. Now, I think I know yes. what symbiosis is, but can you just maybe explain that if it is helpful for, for our sort of contextual understanding? Yes, well, this is in relation to the insect work. Oh, right, and, okay. Um, so the bacteria that we are using to deliver RNA interference in insects are natural symbiotic bacteria of those insects. So every species of insect has its own, if you like, microbiome in its gut. Um, and there are, if you imagine an insect diet, it's it tends to be very specific. There are blood feeding insects, and there are um, uh, insects that feed on plant sap or on pollen. And those sources of nutrients aren't very complex. They're usually deficient in something or or other. And so the reason why insects specifically have certain bacteria that living in their guts is in order to, for the bacteria to synthesize whatever's missing in their diet. I see. And it's, and it's a two-way thing because the insects then provide the, the nutrient and energies mm. for, for the insects to live inside their guts. So mm. that's the symbiotic relationship between the bacteria and the host. Before we talk about the cancer element, you mentioned about how we have antibiotic-resistant drugs, etc. Uh, why do these things become resistant to you know whatever they're becoming resistant to and how big a problem is that um it's a huge problem so antibiotics have been used in medicine since uh, the end of the second world war so the first usage was actually treating um soldiers who were injured in the normandy landings so they were injected with penicillin type antibiotics uh, but since that of course we've discovered Maybe, I don't know, there are probably about 50 or so different antibiotics which are used, frontline antibiotics which are used in medicine. But they tend to be overused. And this creates a problem because uh, they're not being used, they're not being managed sensibly. So not and sometimes prescribed when they're not meant to be prescribed? Exactly, okay. yes. Say if you go to your GP, um, you've got a chest infection, quite often he will 
he or she will prescribe you an antibiotic without actually first-hand knowledge that it's a bacterial infection. It could be a viral infection. But just to be on the safe side, they'll prescribe the antibiotic and you go away and you take it, maybe unnecessarily. But for every prescription, it's more and more antibiotics being used and consequently you're, the, 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 the result is a selection pressure, if you like, for the bacteria to evolve resistance. And bacteria are very good at sharing genetic information. They don't have to be in the same species. Different species share diff different amounts of genetic information with each other. And so an antibiotic-resistant bacterium, which could evolve in one context, that resistance can be transmitted to all these other bacteria, all the other bacterial species. And so it becomes a real problem then with resistance. And hence, that's the problem with the current... We have a, a shortage of frontline antibiotics which can be used effectively. And so diseases which were, say, 20, 30 years ago treatable with antibiotics, we're now facing the, the, the real prospect of them. They won't be able to be treated anymore with antibiotics. What kind of diseases are we talking about here? Um, well, one alarming uh, disease is gonorrhea, actually. So, um, sexually transmitted disease, of course. Um, sexually transmitted diseases are on the increase, worryingly, anyway. Um, but now we're having the situation where the, the gonorrhea bacteria are, in fact, resistant to the, the frontline antibiotics which are being used to treat the patient. I'm sure we'll come back to talking about this topic as, as the podcast goes on. But let's talk about your work um, on cancer uh, in more detail then. I'll, I'll introduce why we got into this area, because it's kind of, it, it, it built on what we were doing with insects. And in fact, the um, one of the guys in Swansea Innovations who was interested in what we were doing with insects, so Swansea University patented the technology we developed for insects. And he said to me, off the cuff, can't you think of something even more useful? So <laughs> um, that got me thinking. And in fact, I was on a sitting on a train coming back from a meeting in Bristol. And uh, I was reading New Scientist. And it, there was an article about what sort of technologies could be present in, say, 50 years time. And so one of the articles was about targeted cancer therapy. and. This got me thinking that what we were doing in insects is very targeted, and I'll talk about that later, but it got me thinking maybe we could do something similar to what we're doing in insects in, for, for treating tumors. And so when I got back to Swansea, I did a bit of background reading. The idea was to look for bacteria that might, could possibly be used to target tumors in a patient. How? For a layperson like me who doesn't have this knowledge, how can that happen? Well, I'm not the person who's discovered this, okay? And I'm fortunate that there was sort of background research sure. in this area. Way back in the beginning of the uh, 20th century, there was an American oncologist who thought it might be an idea to inject bacteria into tumors in patients. Um, the idea was that maybe the bacteria would uh, trigger the patient's immune system to start attacking the tumor. And his name was William Coley. Okay? And his approach actually was remarkably successful. But when he died, the head of the clinic where he worked stopped all that work. William Coley's daughter has done a sort of analysis of survival data from his, all the patients he treated, and her indications are that his treatments were just as successful as contemporary cancer chemotherapy is. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so that's a bit of historical background. And um, so there's, as I say, in the, in the 1990s, it picked up again, and uh, it tied in with, uh, at this time, uh, bacteria were being developed to deliver vaccines into patients. And the idea is that you wanted a bacterium that would not persist in the patient, but it would deliver 
a protein, for example, which would stimulate an immune response. And that patient would then be protected from the organism where that protein came from, not the bacterium. It's being just being used as a vehicle, if you like. So it's not a pathogenic uh, bacterium. Um, so it was a serendipitous discovery that this these particular bacteria, which don't persist in the patient, do persist if the patient had a tumor. In fact, the, the bacteria home in and colonize the tumor, um, and they can't survive in healthy tissue because they can't they the, the i should maybe explain the bacteria are deficient in making all the nutri all the all the nutrients they need to grow and divide they can't find those missing nutrients in healthy tissue but in the tumor cells uh normal metabolism is deregulated it's quite different to healthy metabolism mm. and uh, the consequence is that the tumor cells provide the nutrients for those bacteria to live. So that's, that's one aspect of this. The other aspect is that the tumor, in order to survive in a, in a patient and to evade the patient's immune system, the tumor is what we call immune suppressed. So it's an immune suppressed environment. So the immune system doesn't work in that environment, in that niche. And so the bacteria can survive there. So we thought we could use that property of the tumors, of the bacteria being able to target the tumors. We could um, then add a payload, if you like, to those bacteria, a therapeutic payload, so that once the bacteria colonize the tumor, they continually, continuously synthesize, make the, the therapeutic molecules, and they're made in the in situ, it's actually in the tumor, uh, targeting the tumor cells and no other cells. And that way, um, well, that was the idea anyway, and that's what we've done. And it's very encouraging because we, um, when we do this, we can see the tumors shrinking because of this treatment. The science sounds absolutely fascinating. Are you, are you excited about its potential? I'm very excited. One of the, the neat things about what we're doing is that we're, we, we actually manipulate the bacteria so that they um, produce luminescence. So they're producing light, put it under an imager, and we can see where the bacteria go. After two days, two days after administering the bacteria, the only part which lights up is the tumor. Right. And it's just amazing to see that targeting that such high specificity. Why is this or why might this be better than other treatments for cancer like chemotherapy? Well, chemotherapy is an example of a treatment which is non-targeted. So the majority of uh, chemotherapeutic drugs simply target rapidly dividing cells. So your, the tumor cells are rapidly dividing, but so are your skin cells and your sure. hair follicle cells so hence hair loss mm. and, and the and the cells in your gut lining they're also rapidly dividing so you feel pretty sick because of the treatment um, and it, if anyone has talked to a patient who's undergone cancer chemotherapy they know exactly the the stress it puts you under it's almost as bad as the disease itself so what we're looking for is a, is a much more targeted treatment. So it's hitting bullseye rather than straying off target. And I think what our bacteria are doing is, is helping us to do that. And what stage of cancer are you looking at at the moment? Is it any stage or is it early stage stuff? Um, we have done a bit of work with early stage and I can't really talk about that too much. But I can tell you there is an effect. The bacteria do colonize very early stage uh, tumors. Most of the work has been done with, um, if you like, mid to late stage tumors. And the effect there is, is pretty strong. And do you envisage this one day being you know, available on the NHS? Will this be perhaps the way that cancer is treated in the future? I would like to think that. That's my dream. I mean... As a scientist, you want to do something which is life-changing. 
when we're thinking of timescales, what do you reckon? When might this be rolled out one day? Are we talking years, decades? I think we're talking, uh, I would say, five to ten years. You said about public concerns about all of this, and I could understand why, because when still I think we hear the word bacteria, we think bad thing. Mm -hmm. But that's not the case in most scenarios, is it? No, I mean, we're beginning to understand more and more about, um, if you like, the, the fundamental role our microbiomes play in terms of our biology. So we carry around with us more bacterial cells than there are human cells. And so they're, they're, the bacteria are playing a fairly fundamental role in terms of our biology. There's um, signaling bacteria producing chemicals which in, the, in our guts, which actually modulate how our brains function. So, you know, it's, we're just learning. This is the tip of the iceberg in, ter in terms of understanding the importance of our bacteria to our biology. Um, a minor proportion of bacteria on this planet are harmful to us, pathogenic, but they are a very small proportion. Because you do hear talks about good bacteria, don't you? Yes, exactly. Yes. So they, they, they outnumber the bad ones. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And, and is most of that in our guts then? Or is the it just bacteria? Yes. No, we need bacteria on our skin mm -hmm. to keep our skin healthy, mm -hmm. keep out uh, bad bacteria. So there's a sort of ecological warfare going on on our skin surface. <laughs> so we need the good bacteria there to protect us. Um, so there, there are many examples like that. Yeah. Let's move on to the, to the work with insects and insecticides. And if the cancer stuff is relevant, again, I'm sure we can come back to it. But yeah, tell us more about uh, your work in that area. Yes, well, as I said, it was stimulated by conversations I had with my colleague Miranda. Um, and before she went to Strasbourg, she was working in a bioscience department here in Swansea. And they work, they, the, historically, there had always been a, a colony of an insect called Rodneus prolixus, which is alternatively called the kissing bug. Uh, so this is a, a pretty large insect. It's called a triatamine insect, which comes from South and Central America. And it's responsible for vectoring or transmitting a disease called Chagas, which is C-H-A-G-A-S, Chagas disease. Um, is, that why it's, is that why it's called kissing? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's, it's called the kissing bug because the way... The, the parasite which causes Chagas disease is transmitted from the insect to the human after the insect, the insect comes out at night and when the human is sleeping, it usually lands on its face, the, the human's face, around the eyes and it takes a blood feed and at the same time it usually deposits some feces on the person's skin. The feces contain the parasite, and when you're half asleep you're, and you're, you've got an irritation, your tendency is to rub your eye and the skin around your eye, and in that way the parasites in the feces get into the either wound caused by the biting or into the eye, and that's the way they get into the body, into the bloodstream, and cause the disease. So this the reason why it's called a kissing bug is because it essentially it kisses the human at some point during the night. Lovely. And uh, leaves the calling card, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so we historically there's been a colony of this insect which had been studied um, in terms of understanding more about its biology here in Swansea. So Miranda had worked with this insect, and we knew about the fact that in that insect there is a symbiotic bacteria um, so it's a blood feeding insect blood doesn't contain for example uh, B vitamins which are important for the insect to live so the, the bacteria which are called rhodococcus which live inside the insect they make uh, B vitamins for the insect's benefit so we thought these rhodococcus are very uh, kind of related to the soil bacteria that make antibiotics, actually. So the genetic tools, which I was familiar with using, I, we could use them in this rhodococcus bacterium. And so we manip manipulated it in order to 
produce the molecules to cause RNA interference in that kissing bug. And uh, I still actually remember the day that Miranda came into my office. She had a she'd printed out some images she'd just obtained from the microscope. So what she'd done was dissected some of these kissing bugs and taken out the salivary glands. Now the salivary glands are usually sort of a salmon pink color, but we had targeted the gene which makes the salivary glands salmon pink. So we'd, we'd targeted this, how the, the gene product is made using this delivery system with the bacteria. And uh, the images were outstanding because the one, the back, the back, the insects which had been treated had, she dissected out the salivary glands and they were translucent, just no color at all. So there was, you know, amazing, you know, proof that our technology was working. Um, so we then went on to develop it further and have developed a kind of birth control mechanism for this insect. Uh, so the idea is that we use the bacteria to target a gene which is making a protein which is important for the eggs to develop in the female. So if we put those bacteria into the kissing bugs, into the females, they no longer can produce viable eggs. So we have a birth control mechanism, a way to reduce population size, um, which is highly targeted. These bacteria don't live in other insects. They don't live in us. They don't live anywhere else. They've co-evolved with their host just to live in that particular host. So um, the idea is that we could go back to Brazil, and that's where I go quite often actually now with this insect work. Um, and this could be used as a technology. It could be rolled out as a technology to reduce the population size of this in insect, which is the cause or the vector of this this nasty human disease, which kills about ten thousand people a year. And could that have a wider impact then? That that practice, that method. That you? method, yes. So we are. I mean that the. the the, the really worrisome insects in the world are mosquitoes. Mm. So um, I think mos now, I, I read some statistics quite recently about uh, causes of death of, or the incidence of death caused by animals, the, cause, uh, the incident of human death caused by animals, and mosquitoes are you know, way up yeah. at the top. And... Sharks don't even figure. Yeah, or sort of being charged by a hippopotamus or something like that. <laughs> yes, yeah. that, that doesn't figure. So mosquitoes are way up there. And of course, there are malarial mosquitoes. There are mosquitoes which uh, transmit dengue, uh, Zika, chikungunya, all manner of different diseases. Um, so, yeah, we, are, we have funding from the Royal Society, which is enable us, enabling us to collaborate with a, a lab in Rio de Janeiro, where we're taking, they've isolated bacteria from Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, which are prevalent and vector dengue disease and Zika in, in that part of Brazil. They've isolated bacteria from those mosquitoes. And we are now currently trying to apply this technology, develop the bacteria so that we can put them back into the mosquitoes. And well, the idea with this particular project is to stop females um, feeding on blood. So it's only the female mosquito which goes hunting for blood. Mm. Um, mosquitoes could and do live on, for example, on, on nectar from, from flowers. Um, so the idea is just to change their behavior, not to kill them necessarily, because it would be nice if the bacteria could spread through a population of mosquitoes. So you'd have a population of mosquitoes which no longer fed on human blood, but used an alternative food source. Um, and and th th that way, you would essentially stop the, the virus, the viruses they vector, or the malarial par parasite, in the case of malarial mosquitoes, being transmitted. To me, it sounds like that would just be a huge undertaking to try and stop or to try and eradicate something like oh, malaria. Yes, I agree. It is a huge undertaking. Um, 
So how does what you're doing, how does that sort of begin that process at least? Is it a case of once you've, um, not immunized, that's the wrong word probably, isn't it? But once you've targeted some mosquitoes that they won't be able to spread it on to others, is that the idea? Well, if, if, if we can target the mosquitoes so they don't feed on human blood, and if that spreads through the insect population, mm. then you've got a region which is where the human population is unprotected. Um, but it's, I mean, it's too early to say how in practice this will work. Uh, we're just trying to get, if you like, data, proof of concept data to show that theoretically it could work. And the practicalities involve that stuff that you began with um, at the start of this podcast with the injecting of the mosquitoes, all of which is probably itself very difficult too. Yes. Um, I mean, the, the other application of this technology is, is just to replace that injection, manual injection of mosquitoes in order to study the biology of the insect. So this is a tool not just to stop an insect spreading a disease or to kill an insect. It's also a, a tool to study the insects and their biology in the laboratory setting. Are there links here between what you're doing with the insects that could then potentially be applied to humans? Is this where there's a bit of a crossover between your work on mosquitoes and cancer, or are they separate? Essentially, we're doing very similar things where we're manipulating the bacteria in a very, very similar way and they're delivering similar sorts of molecules to their hosts, yet the human tumor mm. or the insect host. So, yeah, there's, there, is a, there is a very direct crossover between the two. Yeah. Tell us about working in Brazil then. What's that like? How often do you go over there? Um, I've been going over twice a year for the last four years, yes. Uh, it's been very exciting. Um, so I've been to primarily to Rio de Janeiro and a little bit to Sao Paulo too. Um, so it's a very vibrant mm. culture. <laughs> how's, how's your Portuguese? I am learning, okay. yes. You aprendo português. Yeah. You collaborate with groups in other countries as well, though, don't you? Did I read something about um, groups in China? Yeah, this is primarily to do with the work we do with trying to discover new antibiotic producing bacteria so um yeah that, that, this evolved quite out of the blue um i had a email in about 2010 i think it was from a young researcher in china and he was working with a certain type of bacteria looking at what's called osmotic stress in this bacterium and we had already been working with the bacteria that produce antibiotics looking at osmotic stress because we discovered that osmotic stress stimulates the, the bacteria to produce many more antibiotics than they usually do. Um, so we had published a bit of work on what we'd done with osmotic stress in bacteria. And he contacted me because he wanted some advice, some guidance on his research. And so I started, if you like, supervising him at a distance. <laughs> Um, his research was actually very interesting because the osmotic stress was causing the bacteria to do quite different things into, in, in, the, in the way they divide and multiply. I'm, I'm going to have to ask what osmotic stress is. Is it something like osmosis? Osmotic stress is where you expose the bacteria to either a high concentration of salt or sugar, for example, a, a, a sucro, sucrose, for example, which they can't degrade, okay. metabolize, I should say. Uh, so they have to balance what's called the osmotic pressure inside the cell with the osmotic pressure outside the cell, or otherwise they would just burst. So that's osmotic stress. The stress is that period of balancing. Okay. Um, but they're very efficient at doing that. Free living bacteria are very efficient at doing that because they're continuously exposed to changes. Imagine it's a nice rainy day today. So the soil is in terms of what the bacteria in the soil are exposed to, it's like tap water, essentially. There's no salt. Yeah? Imagine, imagine, <laughs> two or three weeks of dry weather in Swansea. <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly, the salt, all, all the water's evaporated, uh, and the local salt concentration 
therefore goes up. And so the bacteria have to adjust to these extremes of environment, if you like, environmental change. Anyway, uh, the bacteria that my colleague Ji Ming in China was working on, the way they adapt is by, instead of being single cell bacteria, they stop dividing in the middle of the cell and they start to form long uh, filamentous structures. So you've got lots of long, very long cells which are all held together in a sort of globule-like fashion. Uh, so it's quite unusual in bacteria. Um, anyway, so he, he'd isolated a mutant which does this all the time without osmotic stress. And uh, he was wanting my advice how to interrogate this, investigate it. And what did you say? It. Well, it, 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 I, I, it, it turned out that I was starting to advise him for, it took about four or five years to complete the project actually. And I ended up going to China once or twice a year to help. Um, so he was working in a microbial ecology institute in a city called Lanzhou, which is in Northwest China, sort of sandwiched between Mongolia and Tibet. Mm -hmm. And surrounded by very extreme environments, you've got the further west, you've got the Gobi Desert. To the south, you've got the Tibetan Plateau, which is very high and also very arid um, and very large extremes in temperature between day and night. Um, so they were trying to understand soil ecology and, the, and the, the role of bacteria in the soil ecology. And I said to them, well, why don't you try and extract some value from the soil um, samples you're taking, see if you can isolate some of these antibiotic producing bacteria called Streptomyces, because they might be new species which are producing new antibiotics. They might be new species because they're, these are extreme environments which no one's sampled before. So that led them to do this in earnest. They got significant funding from the Chinese government to do it. So I've been continuously continuing to help supervise project. But we've also gone on to look at other extreme environments. So for example, we published last year, um, there was a postdoc in my lab, not working directly with me, but he was from Northern Ireland. He was working alongside Luciana, who was come over from Brazil as part of this exchange program I'm involved with. She was, she was actually working on Brazilian streptomyces, producing antibiotics. And Jerry, the lad from Northern Ireland, said, I know about this sacred site in Northern Ireland where they take the soil, they wrap it up in a linen, and they put it on an infected wound. Uh, so that's a, it's a traditional medicine or cure, which has been gone down in, through the generations just by word of mouth. Uh, it probably started in the Celtic era. Um, so he said, I... I it's it's the soil is very alkaline, so it's an extreme environment. Uh, so he said, "Why don't I bring some of that soil back and Luciana can see if she can isolate some of these useful antibiotic producing streptomyces?" And she did. That were, and um, we established that they are new species producing new antibiotics. So that's if you like what you'd call ethnopharmacology. So you know, going back in history, looking at traditional cures and trying to understand potentially what is the basis for those cures working. So, yeah. Thinking a bit more broadly now, you've talked about microbiomes and how they're useful for our health and well-being. Um, on a slightly more, uh, yeah, on a general level, what advice would you give us to improving our health and well-being, you know, from your perspective with your background? <laughs> Um, so always eat a varied and healthy diet. Mm -hmm. That's going to, um, make your microbiome happy. Avoid antibiotics if you can, because any antibiotic treatment will rapidly and drastically change the profile of your microbiome in your gut. One of the key areas of the importance of microbiomes is actually in early childhood development. And I'm talking from actually from birth onwards. There's good data su to suggest an association with um, a high incidence of, for example, asthma and other 
allergies with how much exposure children have had at an early age to dirt, let's say. The, the point is that your immune system, as, as you're developing from birth onwards, needs to be challenged in order to de for it to develop into a healthy immune system. And the way we challenge, naturally, we challenge our immune system to develop properly is to expose ourselves to dirt, which contains bacteria. So, you know, it's probably an innate response for children to stick their fingers in their mouths. And you think they should be doing so? Yes. And I think we're far too um, hygiene conscious in the modern home, if you like. It's great to have a pet dog, for example, where the kid can share bacteria with, um, because again, that's going to help train the immune system. Um, so exposure at an early age will train the immune system and help your normal microbiome to be established and help your immune system to fight off any unwelcome invaders. There might be some new parents out there quite relieved at what you're saying, that they can <laughs> just let their children go out and play in the mud. Yes, well, I think it's a good thing. Good. Now, we talk a lot about um, the technology of the future, and we talk about things like artificial intelligence, etc. Um, what about bacteria-based technology? Are there any other applications for this? Well, for example, if you could find bacteria that colonize your joints... Mm -hmm you could get the bacteria to deliver therapeutics which could be used to treat arthritis, that sort of thing. As in osteo or rheumatoid? Is, it, is there other differences? Um, probably thinking more about osteo. Yeah, so old, old age associated yes. often. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but there are potentially, for example, lung diseases which you could target with bacteria that normally would inhabit that niche. Um, I, you know, it's it, we have a lot to learn about our microbiomes. As I said before earlier, that it's we'd, we'd, what we know is just the tip of the iceberg. I think so far, and uh, understanding the fundamental biology of our microbiomes will then aid us to exploit that knowledge to potentially deliver new therapies using that route. Um, in terms of going out in to the other aspects of the world. I mean, I, I tend to get hung up on insects because I know, well, I've been learning more about them mm. <laughs> over the last few years. Uh, and again, we're only, we only understand about the microbiomes of, of a handful of species of insects, and there are literally millions of species of insects in the world. Uh, I was recently in China, um, where I was combining talking about insects and antibiotics on a visit where I went to five different cities. Um, at Shanxi University in uh, Taiyuan City, which is in Shanxi province, uh, they work on locusts, migratory locusts. So migratory locusts um, are an agricultural pest. They can swarm and devastate a crop or a surrounding area even. Um, and I didn't know until oh, the, the group in Shanxi University were very interested in what we are doing. And they thought, well, could we not collect, collaborate and use our technology in locusts? So I said, I don't know enough about locusts yet. So I came back and read about them. And uh, I... I was blown off my seat, if you like, by the fact that I read that, in fact, it's these migratory locusts are normally solitary insects. And it's only under certain conditions that they, they come together and swarm and, and multiply and generate the huge uh, swarms which cause all the uh, destruction. Um, and one of the key triggers for this swarming behavior are chemicals which their bacteria are producing. Mm -hmm. So these are chemicals which are what we call volatile. They escape into the atmosphere. The other members of the species can sense 
these volatile chemicals. And so they come together. So um, that's really encouraging for us because it means we can take these bacteria, which are responsible for the swarming activity, and maybe exploit them to stop the swarming activity and prevent the damage that these insects carry out. People might be listening to you and thinking, not only is this really interesting stuff, but it's also got a social good as well, because you're doing potentially life-saving work. How would you encourage people if they are interested in getting into your line of work? I mean, what was your route into it all? Um, yeah, so I left school with not a very excellent set of A-levels, I must say. I did a degree in the University of East Anglia, Biological Sciences, where I was introduced to genetics and it became my passion. I mean, it just, something clicked. So I graduated um, from UEA, University of East Anglia, went on to do a PhD, Glasgow University, um, working, doing genetic work in bacteria. And I've, that was just a stepping stone then to, to work in first Canada, then Germany, France, and then finally to come to Swansea and set up my own group. So the key to this, I guess, is um, for someone starting or thinking about this sort of career, they should research into university degree courses, go to a university, try and get into a university where the course will stimulate them, as I experienced, and uh, go from there, yes. And if possible, see the world. I mean, it's a wonderful opportunity to see the world. And uh, I mean, too many scientists in the UK are, are not confident about leaving these shores, and uh, well, for the wrong reasons, I think. Global research, indeed, Paul. Thank you ever so much. Uh, if you want to find out more about Paul's research, you can visit his staff profile at Swansea University's Medical School webpage. To find out more about this podcast and Swansea University's research, visit swansea.ac.uk forward slash research. That's all from us today. Thanks for listening. And thank you again to our guest, Professor Paul Dyson. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, rate and review. I'm Sam Blacksland, and that was Exploring Global Problems from Swansea University. <laughs>